international change in themselves first. Sonia is a professional NLP practitioner and she's an Associated Certified Coach with the International Coach Federation. Please join me in welcoming Sonia. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? That's great. So I don't have to use the manual microphone. So I'm so excited to be here today, talking next to such great speakers and trainers as well. Because I'm going to talk about something I'm very passionate about, which I'm hoping might help you as well as it helped me when I, I discovered what I learned throughout my career, especially in the last three, four years. What I'm going to teach you today is how to speak English perfectly without an accent. <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not going to do this. We're going to talk about communicating to influence though. So if it's not going to be about language and words, we, because I, I, cannot, I clearly cannot do this, right? I'm Italian, and I'm an engineer more than that. You know, we, as engineers, we are entitled to our grammatical mistakes. So, if it's not about language and words only, which are important, we're doing so much more, which you have seen throughout this conference already, and this is really, uh, you covered a lot, and it's kind of intimidating as well. It can be overwhelming. So, what's to communication besides words and language? Body language. Mm -hmm. Body language, absolutely. So the way I am standing and the expression of one's face, this all communicates when we are, we are interacting with each other. What else? Language and body language, but there is so much more that you have touched already there. Sorry? Tone and voice. Tone and voice, yes. Yeah, so the, the, all these other things that are very difficult to describe because body language, you can still give a description of it, but there is so much more, which I would love to call energy. There is something which we send, which we transfer to each other when we are communicating, which we can't describe. However, I attended a talk yesterday by Sally Doyle who mentioned stress and how we transfer our own stress with each other through something which we can't pick with our nose and smell, which is not, we, we don't understand through our nose, but through our brains. It's very difficult to, to understand, but it is there. So how we call it energy, and this is what I'm really passionate about, understanding what's in communication, which, we, which would help, which helps uh, us being more effective and, and becoming influential and inspiring because I really believe that everyone can be inspiring, everyone can be influential and we can, especially women, and I apologize for where I see a gentleman there, <laughs> which is something I'm very particularly passionate about, helping women progress in, uh, in uh, their career because of course it's something that I experienced personally. And, uh, and, so, and so today this is what uh, we're going to, uh, in this talk, we're going to focus on. And actually words are only 5% of communication and energy takes about 95%. Imagine how huge that is. So, while I was preparing the talk, I realized that there's so much to it that could be overwhelming. And uh, because I'm an engineer, I have decided to simplify it. And I prepared my list, which I'm going to give to you. It's very simple, and it is a summary of what I have learned through training as a coach based on neuroscience, based on my experience coaching clients at all levels, from graduate to executives, and also based on my personal experience and learning and the theory of uh, intrinsic motivation as well. So the training uh, based on neuroscience that I'm referring to is called MBIT, Multiple Brains Integration Techniques, that suggests, that is based on neuroscience and suggests that we don't have only one brain that is evidently here. How many brains do you think we have? Two? Who thinks we have two brains? Some, some people might think that others don't have one brain. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hands. Who thinks we have two brains? Two brains? So the rest, more than two brains? Yep. Three brains? You know that already? You know what I'm talking about already? Awesome, don't tell me. Okay. 
<laughs> so we have three brains based on this science, but probably in future they will discover that we have other systems, neural systems, one in our head, one in our heart, and one in our guts. And so the framework that I have prepared for, for this session um, suggests three virtues. I'm going to present to you three virtues that I believe every influencer and every person who is really inspirational taps into and really possess. And I believe you also can develop if you, if you don't feel comfortable already using them. These three virtues tap each one into one of these three brains. And I'm going to tell you about them soon. We, um, we have a video that summarizes beautifully what I am going to talk about, the three virtues. And because it's my framework and it's my summary, it is open to challenge. And I would love you to challenge what I'm going to present. And I would love you to share your ideas about what we are going to talk about. You don't have to. But in order to do that, I would like to reinstate something you might have spoken about already. And that is that this is a non-judgment zone. There is no right or wrong. And no one knows all the answers. And so you should feel free to share what you think. You don't have to, but just imagine how much more you can get from each other. 60 people, 50 people, more or less, than just from me talking to you. And so, you know, I'm Italian, I'm lazy. I don't want to just tell you stuff. I would like to learn from you. And so uh, I'm hoping to make this as experiential as possible. And in order to do that, I would like to get you to reflect on three things before we get on with the video. So the first thing is, who is someone who's really, you find inspirational? You don't have to share this necessarily, but it will be useful for you to check against three virtues. So who is someone you find a role model and highly inspirational for you? Who's that? Coach Sterling. He's, um, he's a disabled athlete. Uh -huh. He's um, a gold medal Paralympian. Uh -huh. yep. um, and he's just an inspiring person. I love it. I take it. Okay, so everyone, I would like, I would like you all to write down uh, who really inspires you. That's one thing. Second thing uh, is <coughs> your expectations from the session. You don't have to share this, but this is going to help you. This is going to inform the final questions, perhaps, once we have finished. So what do you, what, what do you expect from this session after you, you went through all this already? Your expectations. Just write down one, two things, whatever that is. And you don't have to share it. This is for you to help you reflect on the topic before we start. Your expectations. And the third thing is a task. I would like to encourage you to write down a task that you, you have to do what you're doing, but you're not exactly, you know that you can do better at it. So something, you, you again don't have to share this. A task that you know you can do better. So we can check if by developing these virtues, you might get something more out of it. You don't have to share it. Okay, so before before I give you my list, I have I have found this beautiful video that is by Dennis Finn. Dennis Finn. Anyone knows Dennis? Dennis Finn? No? Dennis Finn is the CEO of a management consulting firm called Advision. And uh, I find him very inspirational. Uh, at the time of the video, he was the head of HR of PwC, the largest accounting firm that we know. And uh, he was having about 150, 180,000 accountant, accountants. Can you imagine that? 180,000 can that's scary, right? So uh, as, as the head of HR, uh, he's giving this speech at Microsoft in 2007. It's a finance conference, and he's giving advice on how to become a trusted advisor 
to IT professionals probably. And this is what you want to become if you want to be in, in, uh, inspirational and influential. And why would you want to do that? Why do you need to be influential in your role? So we all know that the government is going to a lot of change and uh, there is a lot of pressure to perform better and to do more with less. And there is a demand from customers for more transparency. How many of you deal with external clients as well, rather um, uh, besides internal stakeholders? How many of you deal directly with customers externally? Do you feel this pressure to for more transparency and for greater customer service. This is what this is what I've been seeing lately in uh, across different sectors as well. And there is a demand for digitization as well. And even as an engineer, I find it challenging and harmonization between departments. And so processes are changing. And uh, I don't know how many other Asians, which I can't really imagine. So there is a demand to do more with less. And also, I'll be reading a report some years ago showing that over 50% of the public service is at a level that is higher than APS6. Is anyone here, I, I think this, um, uh, this conference is targeted to APS5 and 6, but is there someone at a higher level than APS6? Yeah, to someone? Very few, very few, but the majority of you will be at APS5 or 6. So what's the challenge there? You're dealing with uh, staff and colleagues who who clearly don't report to you. And this is, this is the challenge. This is when you can't simply tell people what to do. You need to draw them along. You need to, you need to become attractive and magnetic and you need to create that trust with people so that they will want to do what you want them to do, what you think is the best thing to do. This is the difference between influencing and, and managing and leading from a place of authority. You don't have the authority, but it is still possible to do it. Everyone can be inspirational and influential. So this is, this is uh, where, where I think the challenges are and the need for you to, to be more influential, to do more with less, to get things done through other people who don't report to you. But also, even executives, I work with a lot of executives who struggle getting people to do what they want them to do and they report to them. A lot of executives fail because they, they fail getting people who report to them do what they need them to do. So it's a challenge for everyone. This is really crucial for you to do and I believe you can achieve it. And uh, I'm very excited about the topic. I don't know if you can tell. So, so here is uh, Dan Sim talking to this this um, audience of IT specialists and what does he talk about? Becoming a trusted advisor. It says, you know, Tom Peters talked about experiences being holistic in nature and overpowering and overwhelming. You know, experiences are as distinct from services as services were from goods. You know, think about the experience that you're creating for your, not only for your users from a Microsoft standpoint, but your clients internally. I'll let you read this one. It's a, um, Kind of reactive. If you can't read the bottom of that, it's like a Harley executive who said that. Harley Davidson. I mean, how many people actually, that's interesting, how many people in the room uh, have a, a Harley Davidson? Is that true? Yeah, it's true. How many people have 43 year old accountants in the room? <laughs> All right, now if you, if you doubt this term experience and creating experience for your, not only for your clients, but for your people in the office, you know, you have to make this thing fun. You've got to make the experience fun. This, this next one I just love, it's simple and crisp and... It's like it was a circus. Like sawdust and donkeys and like, and now look at this thing, it's like theater and it's life and you know, and now they're charging like 200 bucks a ticket and what was like $3 a ticket. So you know, if you want to worship at the altar of shareholder value, they create experiences. That's where the money is, that's where the world is going. So create experiences for your people and for your client. So the key takeaway, the final slide, 
Uh, and I'm going to leave you with a video which will kind of close this thing out and then we're going to come back after the break. But So the path to trusted advisor takes time. You just don't, you know, you don't get there unless you spend time with this thing. And you really do have to care and you really do have to invest in client relationships. You know, clients and consumers are becoming much more demanding. The world is becoming much more demanding. People are wanting more. They're wanting, you know, multiple options. Your clients are um, dealing with that external world that has got all the dynamics that's going on that's putting them under pressure. So we have to be better. Pen knife is not going to cut it. I haven't thought of it before. Swiss Army knife. Be a Swiss Army knife. You know, polish your one blade. Your one big blade that got you in the game in the first place. But remember, what are the other elements of your Swiss Army knife? You know, this cultural thing is critical. I mean, you know, culture, the culture, the internal culture in this room is that it's, it's kind of like whoever said the small things are important in culture was wrong. Small things are everything. You know, how you treat people, how you serve the coffee, what you do with your people, how you speak to each other, how you look after the people who support you. Small things in culture are everything. So in the end, this is the final slide, it is all about experience and it's all about creating this kind of holistic view. We don't just create an experience for fun, the purpose of experience is to differentiate yourself and your, you know, from what the market's doing so that you can continue to you know, build that value. To differentiate you need courage, you need courage to kind of step outside and again, you know, I see, you know, if Bill Gates on the stage there's a real buzz for me seeing you know, the guy in the flesh who was, you know, made a, a huge mark on the on the world. I mean, you know, to do that requires courage. But courage is at Bill Gates level. Courage is at your what does it mean to you, you know? <coughs> this thing about being different, everybody wants to everybody is unique and everybody wants to show their differences, but they also want to fit in, which is the kind of the the dichotomy of everything. But Anything great in the world was once different. You know, anything great in the world was once different. You know, and to, to create difference, you've got to have that courage. So great things happen when people dare to be different. I'm going to show you a, a video clip that shows some, you know, magnificent people from around the world daring, daring to be different. It's an honor and a pleasure to be on the stage here today and stand near this place here that Bill Gates stood. Thank you. So, so he is evidently very um, emotional by the fact that he spoke just after Bill Gates. And um, I, I, I asked him to send me links to um, other videos that he has recorded. It's really inspiring. And I, I, I encourage you to search him as well. And he really believes in what he says. So, what are the key takeaways from his message, you think? What did you like about it? What did you disagree with? I did not do some Technical excellence is just the beginning, it is only the beginning. But there is, there are a lot of other things there that you that you need to become a trusted advisor, and you need to you need to differentiate yourself. And in order to differentiate yourself, it takes courage, the courage to step outside and to stand for what you believe in. <coughs> it takes courage. Is it a trivial thing? And culture, culture, from the little things and the way you treat each other the way you speak to each other, the way you serve the coffee. What's coffee got to do with culture? So this takes up directly straight <coughs> to the first virtue, which is courage. I don't want to it's fine. Okay. I'm just going to write the three Three qualities I believe every influencer possesses that make them 
influential and draw people to them and make people trust them. And the first one, I believe, is courage. And uh, if you saw some of the videos by Simon Sinek, he also says courage is the one quality that he believes all real leaders possess. So what do you think is the brain that, that engages with courage? Which one? Where does courage come from? How else do you describe it? Heart, that from French, literally, that means heart. But when you're being brave, how else do you say it? How do you say it? Don't you say you have guts? Mm. Or they don't have guts. So courage and, uh, and uh, daring and being bold, that willingness to take in risks, is a quality of our guts that regulates territory and identity as well. Now, because I, I really want this to be interactive, I would like you to take some minutes at your table to discuss between each other why courage is so important. And if you, and why do you need courage in others to trust them? And if you don't agree, why you don't agree? Would you agree with that? Would you want to do that? Yeah, is that okay? Just a couple of minutes. So at your table, just discuss why courage is important to be, to be trusted.
and the older lady was quite happy to be a bonus. Yeah. She welcomed it. She thought it was a position for her. Obviously, it's been out here. It's good to him. I could get on with her. There needs to be other people who can't get on with her. No, I'm not going to be on with her. Why would you want to, would you follow someone who has courage? Why is courage is important if you want to be followed? Someone wants to share? You, 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 can, you, you feel you can trust them because yeah. they are brave. They are bold and they take decisions. Yeah. I think it's, it is about trust, you know. So um, I'll kind of share my experience. So I trust my director. And Everybody is me. So whatever she were to say, or you know, she would give me some advice, or no matter what she asks me to deliver, I can go with courage and say, yeah, I can do this because I trust exactly what she's giving me. But if it's someone that I may not have that relationship with or that trust, I kind of question, is this right? Should I be doing this? Okay. So it seems like you feel you can be brave, you can be courageous with people you can trust. Which, uh, when, when you don't trust someone, you might not have the courage to do the same things. Well, I believe what, what I am saying is you would need courage. You would need to find the courage, even with people you don't trust, if, if you want to become influential. So that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we don't always have it. We are kind of selective. With some people, we are brave and we take moves. With some others, in some other contexts, we don't. However, if you want to be influential, you need to take steps. That's why you need courage. You need to start something. You will be at the forefront of things. You don't necessarily have to. It just means that if you're not, you're not influencing, you're following, which is perfectly fine. You don't necessarily have to lead. Influencing means leading without the authority to do so. If you want to be influential, you will find yourself at the forefront, taking decisions, taking bold decisions, and wanting and needing the help of others, getting things done in your role through other people. More and more things done through other people, starting things, proposing new ideas, offering your ideas. Is it easy to offer ideas all the time? Do you find it comfortable? What can happen when you offer ideas? What can happen? Yeah, shut down. Ju judged? Yes. Does it take courage? Yeah. And uh, so, so you 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 risk to be shut down. So you need courage in order to be able to take risks because it is important that you offer your ideas anyway. You have to. Otherwise, again, you will be following, and you are not going to drive the change. Because this is your opportunity, with all that is happening in government, this is your opportunity to not only be part of the change, but to drive it. If you want to, and you can, be more influential, you have to drive the change. You have to offer those ideas. You have to, you have to be willing to take risks and to do the most horrible of the things. You know it. <laughs> Who likes making mistakes? <coughs> Who likes to make mistakes? You love it. So, <coughs> so tough. Can learn from some of the kids. Lovely. So you, you can make it. We're taking the risk. Not always. Not always. <laughs> what can happen? What can happen? Well, sometimes they don't like making the mistake and get frustrated about it. But it's about changing the attitude and how you view that mistake to be a positive. Changing your attitude and how you view those mistakes and learning from them. 
So while well, talking to an executive in uh, one of the largest hospitals in uh, Canberra some weeks ago, he mentioned, uh, uh, he, he talked about one of his staff, one of his executives who failed because he could not get over being a perfectionist. So as you grow and you step out of being a subject matter expert, a technical person into a more of a leader role, you, you, can't, you just can't afford to spend the same time you were spending before on that task. And you have to let go of knowing all the answers. You have to let go of doing a perfect job, job according to your standards. And so you have to take risks and you have to take in particular the risk of making mistakes. This is my invitation to you. Take more risks to make mistakes and learn from them, like your colleague just said. So, to move uh, on to the next, and what happens, by the way, before moving to the next, what happens when you follow someone who is not brave, who has not, not enough courage uh, for the task at hand, at least? What can happen? Would you follow a person who you don't feel is brave, courageous? Who would follow? Someone, someone might? Who would follow someone, a manager, would trust a manager who's not brave? What can happen? What can happen with a manager who's not brave? Fail. Sorry? Fail. You fail. How? Well, the decisions are going to be made. You'll go to the vicious cycle of going down and those steps and things like that. So, no, decision, no decisions taken. And, uh, break, and, and you run in a circle. And what about if decisions were to be made and uh, risks, and you perhaps were offering your ideas and you took the risk to make mistakes and you actually made a mistake and your manager is not a courageous manager. What happens? No growth. No growth. How about pointing fingers? Yeah, blame. Mm -hmm. Blame. Blame. So, if you, I wouldn't follow a person who I don't feel is courageous, and this is something very big for me. I, I feel it. I feel in that energy, courage very much. They will point a finger, they will blame. Yeah. And one of the most important strategies we use with executives is called challenging coaching and uh, helps executives and clients. I mean, it would be useful for you if you uh, have you heard of this before uh, challenging coaching and taking responsibility turning the blame into responsibility. This is something crucial for executives, taking responsibility for whatever happens to them. And it's closely related to the circle of influence and increasing your circle of influence and asking, what can I do? So that's one of the strategies you can use to increase your level of courage. What other strategies do you use to, to develop that courage? Because I believe everyone can be courageous. Can be more courageous we might already be courageous in some areas and less in other areas what can you do to to develop that courage to that you need to differentiate yourself to step outside of your comfort zone knowledge sorry no, knowledge 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 nice nice and what else strategies just do it i love that <laughs> just do it how how do you do it you do the thing that scares you you do the thing that scares you wow you're brave already awesome how about starting small starting somewhere not necessarily i know i'm an engineer and so i'm entitled to be very funny <laughs> so so starting small starting somewhere i for instance i even even not being able to speak i i've always known i wanted to speak and so I joined Toastmasters. You know, you don't end up on the stage directly. I joined Toastmasters. At first, I just couldn't breathe. I, I, I used to breathe up here. And it helped. Little steps, small steps to start. And also, I saw you went through the power pose. Someone, someone showed that to you, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they gave you some specific power poses. Mm -hmm. Some very good ones. So can we repeat that? Would that be useful to repeat it? Can I ask you to just step, uh, to stand up one second? And standing up, can you see from there? You stand up, <laughs> standing up. Let's try a power pose like this. And while you open your chest like that, I want you to feel scared, feel sad. 
feel sad? It makes them feel sad. Is it working? Is it working? No. Okay, good. So this is one of the little... That was it. Yeah, no, sorry. That was it. <laughs> so this is one of the power poses that you can do. You can do to prove that you can change your mood instantly and feel more comfortable and confident even while you write e an email. Because sometimes even an email can be uncomfortable. So there are various strategies. Another that you might know already is thinking of the person you admire a lot and you have written down before. Thinking about that person, your role model. What would that person do in that, con in that context, in the situation you, you are kind of scared of finding yourself in? What would that person do? So think of people you admire a lot. That usually give, gives people courage. Now, before moving to the next virtue, what happens if we overdo it? Is there such a thing of being too courageous? Yeah? I see. What's that? How would you call it? What happens? Sorry? Arrogance. Arrogance. Danger. Danger? Yes. Danger of what? Physically incorrect. Ah, oh, all right. Physi physical danger. That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> Only physical? Only physical? And how about at work? If you were to be too courageous, too confident, right? Overly confident. What happens? What can happen? Mistakes, mistakes, more mistakes, bad mistakes. Which kind of mistakes? If you are overly confident, what can? Yes. Sorry? It's huge. Huge mistakes. Mm -hmm. So reputational risk. Reputational risk. As in people see you as. Oh, too boy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> so, yeah, so you can become overly confident. I used NLP some time ago. I used a few strategies, five, six strategies, one after each other, because I wanted to talk. And after that, at the end of the day, oh my goodness, what did I do? I just wanted to talk about anything. The risk is that you, you're so much into it, you're so passionate about that, that you, you develop a tunnel vision. You don't see anything, anything else. You believe you're so, you're so sure about yourself that you, you, you miss out on what's around it. So what do you need to prevent, to be overly confident? What do arrogant people miss that takes us to the next virtue? Humility. 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 This is my second virtue. This is the second virtue. Humility. Is this correct? This is the second virtue. I believe every, every great influencer and inspiring person possesses. So, so going back to the three brains, I, I would like to, to invite you to think of the three brains as three board directors of your company, your own company. So you've got these three board directors that take decisions independently. What happens if the three directors take three different decisions? Confusion. Nothing happens. So you want all the three board directors on board. And this is why you have to engage with the three brains. All the three. It's not one big thing, one only thing, only courage. No, I believe you need the three of them. <coughs> and what's the result when you have that congruence and that alignment of the three board directors going in the same direction, working on the same mission in parallel and agree on, on, on it. What's the outcome? Success. Success. How about passion? Passion for the mission. So I believe passion is not an ingredient. Passion is the outcome. Passion is what you get. If you are, if you are into something with all of yourself, so does it ever happen to you to feel like a part of me wants to do that, another part of me doesn't want to do it? And you're not really sure and you don't start it. Does it feel familiar with some of you? That's called inner conflict. And that happens based on MBIT, the, the course and the methodology I mentioned before, when the three brains are not aligned. This is what you want to avoid. 
because who is the first and most important person you need to influence first? She's saying her. We need to influence her. Yes, it's yourself. It is yourself. Why do you need to influence yourself first? To get the courage. Let me ask you, have you ever bought something from a salesperson who is, who is like, mm, I think this might be good for you? Hmm? <laughs> would you buy it? No. Would you buy it? Yeah, no. If they're not convinced, why would you buy it? So you need to be convinced first. You need to influence yourself first. And you need to convince all the various parts of you. <laughs> so you need to influence yourself first. And, uh, and, and so, going back to humility, how do you develop humility? Uh, which kind of brain, sorry, which brain does humility engage, you think? Heart, yes? Is it heart? Is it heart? So, yeah, is that heart? Because I believe it's, it's your head. I was confused too, sorry? So, Sorry? Right brain? Right brain or left brain? That's, that's debated. <laughs> Let's not get into that because I'm too passionate about that too. So I believe it's, it's your brain, it's your head. Because what happens when you are too much into something? You're, you, you, you believe you know so much of it that you miss out on information. This is about information. This is the time when you need to step back and put things in perspective and see the bigger picture. So this is an information area. You need to learn, you need to, you need to ask other people, you need to ask yourself, what's in it more than what I already do? Why do you need to do that? Sorry? You have a passion to go ahead. <coughs> Who thinks that they know everything about something? Who? Yeah. Do you know it? Are you? Are you? Are you might have studied something for 10 years, 15 years. And yet, do you think you might know everything about the subject? Do you think you can ever know everything about something? <coughs> no, there is always something that somebody else might add to the table. And uh, actually, this is, this is a biological thing. We all have a limited view of the world, and, and personalities and unconscious bias are a result of this. We are bombarded by thousands of information every instant, and so we have to filter it. We have to, we have to filter it out, and, and that's the reason why we all have a limited view of the world. We only see a little bit of it. It's normal. We all do it. And this is why we need to expand at some point and get other information in from other people. So how can you, do you know any strategies to, to develop humility in this context? In, in the sense of getting perspectives and the bigger picture around the task you are working on? Asking. Sorry? Asking other people. Asking other people. Turning the telling into asking. Turning the judgment into curiosity. Asking other people. Which people? stakeholders, people you're trying to influence, instead of telling them, this is it, what do you think about it? Asking them, asking questions, asking open questions, even better. I know a strategy uh, uh, which is a part of neuro-linguistic programming called perceptual positions. Have you heard of this before? No? So <clears throat> the, the aim in this context is to get an, obje an objective point of view and put yourself in the picture, seeing yourself as part of the picture. So now briefly, an exercise I would like to suggest is that I, I, want, you, I want you to imagine you are standing by that door while you stay seated, you're now standing by the door, looking at the entire room, looking at me standing here and seeing yourself wherever you're sitting. Can you do that? One second, just imagine you are by the door and there you are seeing me and you're, you're hearing what I'm saying 
and you're also hearing and seeing what's around you. You are in the picture and you're looking at me from the door. Strange, weird, these engineers are strange. Can you do that? It takes practice, but it is a really, really powerful strategy, which you can find online as well. I'm happy to send you links so you can practice. It's really one of the most powerful strategies I've learned. But did anyone, was anyone successful in uh, imagining to, to disassociate, which is what the exercise was about, disassociation, looking at yourself from outside of your body. Could you do that? Yeah? Did, did that add any information around the talk? Did you, did you get any more information about this? Even in terms of feelings, just feeling something intangible. No, it takes practice and I will recommend you to give it a go tomorrow whenever you are working on something and you want to get a different perspective and become more humble around that and gain more information. So for me, the way I'm, I'm describing this, for me, humility is a quality of the mind. And this leaves us with the last issue, which needs to engage our heart. And what would that be, you think? What do you need to be influential and inspiring, really? You want to be inspiring, you want to attract people to follow you. What is that quality? Compassion. Compassion, oh, I love it. Yes, compassion and what else? Because I, I, I would embrace it within something even bigger. That's lovely. Compassion, yeah, awesome. Sorry? Empathy, yes, definitely, it's part of it. Knowledge? knowledge from your heart? Knowledge. From emotional intelligence in general, yes. What else? Kindness. Kindness. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. So with one with one word, and as I said, this is my framework. It's my framework. <laughs> <laughs> but you can challenge it. So I will call it generosity. Generosity. What's generosity? What's generosity? Giving to someone else. Giving to someone else. Giving your time to someone else. Sorry? Giving your time. Giving your time. Yeah, beautiful. What can you give? Is it always charity? Is it always money? What what are, what many so empathy is definitely a part of it. To be generous, you need to, to have empathy. To give something to somebody else, you need to understand first. Because what's empathy? Understanding and feeling are another person's feelings. So in order to give your time or something else, you need to understand what they need from you. So besides time and money, definitely, what can you give to, to a person to show them that you care? Like Dennis Finn said, you, you, you need to care. And it's about culture. It's the, way, it's, it's the way you speak to each other. It's the way you treat each other. So what can you give? time and money to charity what else we spoke about coffee sorry wisdom and knowledge yeah you can you can give them your knowledge encouragement and acknowledgement i love it encouragement and acknowledgement of their efforts mm. yes yes mm. what else is there something else Offering help when they're busy. Offering help when they're busy. So, why is this important? Why? Why do we need to, why do you need to be generous? Why do you need to demonstrate that you care? That you're caring for other people if you want to influence them, if you want them to follow you? Why do you need to demonstrate that? You need to show support to get support. We need to show support to get support. So, what if, what if someone wants something from you? What's the opposite of being generous? 
Selfish. Stingy. Stingy. Who likes a stingy boyfriend or partner or friend? <laughs> Selfish, self serving. And going back to the parallel of the salesperson. So, sales has a, 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 such a bad reputation because in the past, a lot of salespeople would try to sell you something, and even these days, which is really good for you. Well, I should talk for me, you know, when someone tries to, to sell me something or sell, sell you something, they might have empathy, for instance. Someone who has empathy and they're very good at understanding and feeling your feelings. And they're so good and they want to sell you something so much that they leverage on your feelings and they succeed. They sell you something. Have you ever had this experience or is it only me? No, we all had that. You bought something, they were so good, so nice. You bought it. And what happens when you go home after some time? Sorry? Exactly. How can you yell it? Buyers remorse. Buyers remorse. I have to repeat this. Buyers remorse. Yes. What happens is that in every experience we first feel and then we think. So, so we we feel we feel good. They make us feel good. But then our brain catches up, and when our brain catches up, our feelings will change. We will realize it. And so, how would you call such behavior? Sorry? No, uh, from the salesperson. How would you call that salesperson? No, no. Sorry? <laughs> How about manipulative? Pushy, pushy. I, I would call it manipulative. So, so if you don't, if you're not generous, if you're not really caring, if you, if you don't really feel it, that you want to help somebody else before yourself, you're going to be felt as manipulative and people will get it. People will feel it. It's about the energy. It's about that life distress. We might not be able to understand it and explain it on the spot, but it's going to catch up. So in the short term, you might think, okay, but I got what I wanted. Yeah, if it's the short term that you're after. But in the long term, if you want people to follow you in the long term, you can't be manipulative. You need to really genuinely care about other people. So how, how can you, how can you develop that generosity? Because sometimes we just, you know, we don't, we can't really understand everyone. We, do, we, do we have to help everyone? Is it easy to help everyone on my face? <laughs> Is it easy to always wanting to help everyone? You think? Someone, someone who always helps others. Yeah. Is there someone who always helps others? No, it's natural. Sometimes we all just need to help ourselves. But if you need to develop that generosity, the closest thing you can develop is empathy. And did you, did you work on empathy already during the conference? So, one strategy which you can use to develop empathy when you really just don't feel like it. You know, that's natural. Sometimes you just, you just don't feel like it. Is, again, the same strategy as I just said before part of neuro-linguistic programming, perceptual positions. This time, I'm going to ask you to do something creepy. So, I want you to jump into my shoes. No, don't do it. However, the motto that says, walk in uh, another shoes for how many kilometers from Indian Americans is, is true. You have to physically, physically imagine that you are in, an, in the other person's body. So now, I, I encourage you to imagine that you are me talking here to you and while you stay seated there, I want you to make the effort to jump into my shoes and imagine and feel how I'm feeling. You're starting sweating. <laughs> it takes practice again. And you have to physically sometimes make the move when you are trying to gain pers the other person's perspective and develop empathy. Could you do it? Could someone do it? Did you, did you, yeah? For some people it's easier, it's natural. 
Yeah, don't tell anyone how you felt. <laughs> so that's a strategy which you can practice and you will become better and better. And I really have to work hard at this, especially, especially when writing emails. And sitting there, I, I had to stop and jump behind the screen, imagining, imagining how the other person would receive my email. That was hard work. So this is a way you can develop empathy to, to gain that generosity which you need, I believe, to become more influential, which you can do. But so with all this jumping, jump outside and jump into their shoes and, uh, and, and try, to, try to understand and give the other before you take. There, is a, there, is a, there might be a dichotomy, dichotomy like Dennis Finn mentioned, we all want to be different. But we all, all also want to fit in. There is this, this contradiction, apparently, that involves being authentic. How do you, how will you recognize if what you should be doing is the right thing for you? Do you, do you feel sometimes this asking yourself, yeah, I have to do that to help the other, but I don't really want to do it, it's not really me. Yeah, is it familiar to you? So what I, uh, with this, when, when I was thinking about authenticity, I came across a sentence, a statement by Emilia Ibarra in um, one of uh, Harvard Business Review's best-selling books. And she says, uh, when one has an unwavering sense of self, they're going to get stuck in, uh, in their present state, trying to be their true self. However, we all go through experiences in life. We all have to. And by going through experiences, we learn and we grow. And this is a journey. It's continuous. It never ends. You will, you, you will always go through something that is going to actually change you. Who is the real you? Who knows? So sometimes you're going to feel like imposters in an attempt to match and fit with the new situation that challenges you. Does anyone here, has anyone here ever felt like an imposter? Yes, a lot of executives, yeah, yeah. Who has never, who has never felt like an imposter? Raise your hands. Someone's never felt like an imposter. Well, well done, congratulations, because, because my wish for you is to keep feeling like imposters. Because by feeling like imposters, that means you are pushing your boundaries and you are getting them outside of your comfort zone in, a, in that space where, in the only space where there is growth. We all have to. But so, the question is, how much is too much? How do, how do we blend it? How do we know when we're really stretching it too much? And my, advice the strategy that i would like to suggest is to refrain it to refrain it in the long term so in 10 years whenever you find yourself asking yourself is this something i should do is this right or is it too much of a stretch so imagine you're 10 years older and from there you've been successful you made through it <coughs> however you did it and from there 10 years forward, you look back. Was it worth it? Should you do it? So your why, ask your wise self. Ask your wise self if you should do it. That's my, that's my strategy for you to understand when, you, when it's appropriate to, to compromise and when instead it's no, 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 it's not worth it. And I think, I think this is, this is what I, I have prepared for you and uh, my greatest satisfaction for you in closing would be that if we cross path in the future ever again, that you might tell me, Sonia, you know what? Just that one little thing that you said was really useful for me to progress my career. Just one little thing. And if you were to find that one little thing, within the entire talk, what would that be for you? What's the biggest takeaway? What is, if any, perhaps it was all useless, 
But what could that one little thing be in the talk that you might use starting from tomorrow? Thank you. So, was there any quick questions then, Dr. Sonia? We took 10 minutes at the beginning, so we had to shift the agenda slightly. Was there any questions? Can I get everyone to stand up? Because I know the energy's dipping. Yeah. All right, who wants to show me how to pick real food? <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, I saw some hands. Hands bending, groovy. Let's do it quick. Just to reinforce it. How do you tell if it's real food? <laughs> all right, all right, that was rubbish. That was rubbish. Okay. But how do you know if it's real food? Can you pull it from the ground? Pick like it from a tree? Hunt it while it walks? Fish it from the sea? Then it's for me. If it's not, maybe it's not. Cool. All right, you can see. Do a little bit more energy now. That's all you have to do in the workplace. Just go and do some plucking and pulling and hunting and fishing. Okay. Can I invite the panelists to come up and get settled? I'm aware that there's some people that need to leave at 3.30 in the coffee break to go and get their flights. 